Hello everybody, welcome to ECMATH. Today we're going to talk about polar graphs. Um, I am recording this on a different computer than usual so that I can show you some things on Desmos that I couldn't show you before. Uh, but that means that I'm not going to, be able to do any drawings by hand. So what we're going to do is this video is going to be kind of a basic introduction to polar graphs. We'll go over all the different types. Um, but then I will show you in a separate video how to graph and record all these things by hand. All right, so polar graphs, what are they? Well, a polar graph results from a polar function. Uh, so we would say that every polar graph is a function uh, r equals f of theta. Now, when we write r equals f of theta, right, it's, it's a function notation, uh, we mean that the input values to the function are thetas, and the output values from the function are radii. Often with polar graphs, one other thing that's included is boundaries on theta. Um, just like you might on a rectangular graph say, hey, make this graph from x equals 3 to x equals 7, um, right? This is basically a fancy domain. You can tell I'm not on my regular computer right now. Um, when you're looking at a polar graph, though, they really are functions, which means every theta value gives you a single r value, and that's how we're going to graph and actually plot out these polar functions. So I have below here a picture that you maybe recognize, um, or if you don't, uh, it's a picture of a radar dish or radar display, uh, which is what you would use to track planes. If you've seen any kind of old uh, war movie or new war movie, I don't know, uh, really any kind of movie about airplanes, there's probably one of these somewhere in there. And what you, if you've seen these movies, you know that this green thing is kind of like an arm uh, that spins around consistently and they often make little beep 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 sounds and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, they're very fun little things to look at. When we think about our polar graph though I really do like to think about it as sort of a radar screen and this radar screen um, actually even kind of looks like a polar graph. That's why I chose this one although you can tell right away that it was not designed by a mathematician because zero is in the wrong spot. Uh, and apparently the angles go the wrong direction. So we're going to ignore that, though, and pretend that this is just a straight old polar graph. So on a polar graph, well, that's not going to work. You would have the polar axis and the pole. And then your theta would sweep around in the counterclockwise direction. And at every value theta, what you can imagine is this kind of line of the radar saying, hey, here's some value of theta. At that value of theta, there is some r value. You need to make a little x for that r value. Then you let theta sweep around a little more. At this value of theta here, maybe there's a new r value. Sweeps around a little more. Maybe r is now decreased here for some reason. Sweeps around a little more. I went a little farther. That's fine. Uh, maybe r got big again. That can happen. Sweeps around a little more. Ooh, maybe at this angle, the radius is actually really small. It got small sweeps around a little more. Maybe R is kind of back in the middle. And then what happens, you can imagine, right, that this is not, uh, you know, if this was radar, this would be like seven different airplanes flying around that you're seeing on the radar. But what we are seeing is one single graph, right? This is the graph of a single polar graph. So what you would now do is connect the dots. Let me give you an initial value. Let's say maybe uh, we started right in the middle. That was our, when theta was zero, we had an R value. What you do is you connect the dots in some logical way and you connect them sequentially. When you connect them, just like when you connect a graph, you would connect them with some kind of smooth curve. Maybe R would continue. I'm just going to imagine what we would have. You know, some kind of smooth, maybe mushy curve where it kind of waves in and out a little bit, sort of like a distorted circle. And that's an example of a polar graph and how they're created. You imagine theta is swinging around the entire unit circle. For every single theta value, there is an r value. That r value gets plotted. And then the plots that you have created are connected with a smooth curve. And that creates a polar graph. So I'm going to now take you to uh, Desmos. And we're going to look at some actual examples of polar graphs. Uh, here's what I was playing with a little earlier. And I don't know, I'll show it to you right now. Um, what you can see is that we have an equation. This one is, happens to be r equals 8 sine theta. And I have set up some sliders here so that it draws it sequentially instead of just drawing the whole thing in one move. Um, and as you let the slider play, 
Uh, imagine that there is some kind of radius tracing around. Let's do this. So let's let k increase, right? So this is, k represents here the angle as being drawn. So we're starting out at angle zero. It looks like the radius is zero as the angle increases. So you're imagining there's some angle increasing. The radius increases. Oh, and we got to kind of a maximum. And now as the angle increases, the radius is decreasing. Okay. Ooh, ooh. So now the radius gets back to zero. And this is where the cool stuff really starts to happen. The angle is still increasing positively through the first quadrant, but because of the way this equation is, we're actually getting a negative radius. And it's going to make one kind of another loop with a negative radius in the because the angle is in the first quadrant, but the negative of the first quadrant is the third quadrant. That's why it's drawing in the third quadrant. Now let's just watch this whole thing play out, and you can see what it looks like. Um, so this is an example uh, of a rose curve. This is one of our really cool families of polar graphs. We're going to come back to these rose curves in a little bit. So that was the rose curve, but before we really look at those, we're going to go way back to basics and look at circles. And I really do think this is something that's best done with Desmos in hand um, or a graphing utility. You can do these on your graphing calculator, but it's a lot easier, a whole lot easier on Desmos to see all of the subtleties of the graph. So that's what I'd really recommend. If you're at desmos.com forward slash calculator and you're in this window, you're not quite equipped to graph polar. Let me show you a couple tricks that you can use for graphing these in polar. First, you're going to go to your graph settings menu and change your grid style from rectangular, you can see the rectangles, to circle. Now you're in polar mode. Awesome. Take this time to turn projector mode on if you want. Don't have to. Um, it still gives you the option for the axis labels, for the x and y axis. You don't really use the y axis in polar, so I'm just going to turn that off. I'm going to leave just the x axis. Yeah, I'll turn it back on, actually. Okay, now if I want to graph a polar graph, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is go over here to your window. We already talked about polar graphs are always uh, functions where r is a function of theta. So just like you would write y equals 2x, I'm going to write r equals 2. And to get the theta symbol, you can go to the little calculator menu down here, but that's a huge waste of your time. You can just type in the word t-h-e-t-a. And as soon as you type theta, there you go. Um, you'll also notice that Desmos detects that you're creating a polar graph and actually gives you bounds on theta. So for this graph, it said 0 it should be less than theta, should be less than 12 pi. It chose 12 pi, I think, because of how we are currently zoomed, but it kind of makes an automatic selection for you. You can also change that. Say I only want theta to go to 1. Oh, look, there you can change it. Actually, you'll notice how uh, this draws only a fraction of the graph. Now this graph I just typed in to kind of be an analog to like y equals 2x, but this is actually a really cool graph to analyze as well because this is a polar spiral. Let's zoom out on her. You can see that it really is a spiral. Why is that happening? Well, as theta increases, and you can see from this line kind of theta increasing, the radius also increases, right? It's just two times the angle. So when the angle is pi over 6, the radius is 2 pi over 6. Uh, and I can only really show you the first quadrant, but you can imagine as our uh, the angle continues around, so does the radius, and you get this increasing spiral. So that's the first kind of polar graph. They're not really very exciting because the only thing you can really do is change the slope. Uh, so you can make this 1 theta, make it a little tighter, make it 0.5 theta, make it a little tighter than that, make it 7 theta, make it be longer, right? That's just making kind of like the whole spiral longer or shorter. Um, that's pretty boring. Okay, but now you know how to get an R and a theta. What really gets exciting is when you start typing in some tricks. So I'm going to type in the very first polar graph we're going to make, and then we'll explore this, spend some time really exploring this first family. And that family comes from trig functions. The first one is R equals cosine theta. Notice it automatically changes my bounds from 0 uh, to pi instead. That's Desmos being very helpful. Let's go back to the standard zoom level and zoom in and you'll notice what have we created we've made a circle and this is the circle family it should not surprise you that a uh, graphing system defined in circles and that uses trigonometry which also comes from circles is really really good at graphing circles and i want to you know highlight something right in the rectangular coordinate system what do you have to do to make a circle x squared plus y squared 
equals, uh, let's do 8. Right? To make that circle, I had to type in a whole bunch of exponents. This thing isn't even a function. Um, it's, I, it's, I have to do some crazy math to center it at the origin in polar. Guys, look at this. This is so easy. This is such a wonderful equation, right? Cosine's about as easy as you can get. We're going to explore why this graph is a circle in a second, but let me show you one, you know, the next thing you might try after you decide what a graph circle is, is you might start playing around with the equation. You might start, say, uh, putting some coefficients on the front. So what if I make this 2 cosine theta? Oh my gosh, look, my circle is now twice as large. It goes from 0 to 2. What if I make this 5 cosine theta? Oh my gosh, my circle now goes from 0 to 5. So this is a really nice way to change the size of your circle. Instead of having to change the radius and do r squared, you just change the coefficient. Uh, we can make that a slider. You can make your circle as big or small as you want. Oh, look, you can get a circle in the opposite direction with a negative coefficient. We'll maybe come back to that one. You can get a circle as big or small as you want. And these are all just perfect circles. They all touch the origin, and they all have a boundary that seems to be just equal, uh, a left or right boundary, just equal to the k value. Okay, so why is this true? Let me set this back to 2. And I'm going to switch programs and show you why this actually happens. So I'm over here in a program called GeoGebra. We've maybe used it before. And what I like about this program uh, is it shows you a couple things. One is it shows you the graph of 2 cosine t. You can read t as theta or x or y, or, or, or not y, but x. Um, and it shows you both the Cartesian graph, right? Remember, our, our Cartesian is another name for the rectangular graph. This is the standard graph of that equation and the polar graph. And what's pretty magical is as I drag this point around the Cartesian graph, We'll also see the polar graph begin to be drawn. So I'm going to draw this polar circle uh, just little bit by little bit, and maybe we'll talk about what's happening. So you notice that because our graph is cosine, when theta is 0, what does cosine do at 0? It starts at its highest value. In this case, it's 2 cosine t, so the highest value is 2. What does cosine do after that? Well. As theta increases, right, theta is in this graph, the rectangular graph, it's the x-axis. As theta increases to pi over 2, the radius or the, you know, the height slowly decreases. Our height over here is our radius. So as the angle increases to pi over 2, that is vertical, the radius should slowly decrease. Let's see if that happens. So increasing the angle, look at that radius. It's slowly decreasing. Increasing the angle, there we are halfway. Or there we are halfway. Two thirds of the way. And then as the angle approaches pi over 2, approaches vertical, what's the radius at pi over 2? It's perfectly zero. How do we know that? How would we know that without this tool? Well, we could think about the graph of 2 cosine x. At pi over 2, 2 cosine x is equal to zero. Okay, what happens next? Because like what I might expect is, okay, we did this, and then maybe the graph is going to bounce back, or maybe it's going to bounce into the other quadrant. Remember that the theta is now going to be a, a second quadrant angle, right? So our, our green line is going to advance into the second quadrant. But let's think about what happens in cosine graph here. Cosine graph becomes negative. So as theta keeps increasing, let me put theta kind of over here. Uh, we'll put it right on here. So I'm going, to, I'm going to move the green theta line until it's exactly on one of these grids, which means this is at 2 pi over 3. So theta is exactly positive 2 pi over 3. But at that value, positive 2 pi over 3, the third, second quadrant angle, the value of 2 cosine 2 pi over 3 is a negative value. It actually is, happens to be negative 1, right? We can see that from this graph right here, negative 1 at that value. On the polar graph, that's represented with the negative radius going the other direction. Okay, so let's keep going. Let theta increase. Let's let theta increase all the way to pi, right? We're going to go flat, completely flat. All right, so theta is now at pi, 3.15, 4, same deal. Um, what do we know about the cosine of pi? We know that the cosine of pi is negative 1. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. So what we really is happening here is we're drawing the angle pi, and we're counting two units backwards. Where does that give us, though? It lands us right back at 2. Now, if you look carefully, you'll notice something. 
The full graph is complete, and we barely use even a section of this cosine graph, right? The cosine graph continues infinitely on. So let's see what happens if I get a point further out on this cosine graph. Look what's happening to the polar graph. It's just repeating. It's just repeating. Uh, my slider only goes from 0 to 2 pi. So notice as you move the slider, let's let it move itself here. As the slider goes from 0 to 2 pi, it draws the circle from the first kind of part of the cosine graph. And then because the cosine graph has that symmetry, what goes down must go back up. It draws the circle again. And so Desmos actually knows this. When we graphed our circle on Desmos, it automatically set the bounds from 0 to pi, not 2 pi. Why? Because pi is enough, right? There's the bound. If I set this bound to 2 pi, nothing changes because this it's, I mean, technically something has changed. It's the same circle drawn twice. And that's it. That's the only difference. I personally think there's a little, there is an important subtle difference. Let's let pi, uh, let's go, you know, over here at 3 pi, uh, I'll go over here. Here is perfect. Notice that when theta is a uh, 4.18 radians, right? That's four radians. So that's going to be somewhere in the third quadrant. The angle theta is in the third quadrant. We're getting negative radii out of that, which is why it's drawing the top half of the circle. And then when we go all the way to the fourth quadrant, right? Theta is in the fourth quadrant. We're getting positive radii again, and we're drawing the bottom half of the circle that already is in the fourth quadrant. And so that's kind of, it kind of, yes, it draws the same circle twice, but I think it is interesting that the second time around draws the, the first time around, we should say, draws the positive radii, then the negative radii. And the second trip around draws all the negative radii, and then all the positive radii, and it kind of ends back where it started with a positive 2 value, right? This is the second time it happens to hit positive 2, ready to draw more circles. So I really love this tool. This is done in uh, built in GeoGebra. It was not built by me. It was built by uh, a gentleman whose name is Jay Mulholland. And I will link you this uh, site right here in the video description. But uh, I don't know. Thank you, Jay Mulholland. You look like a really nice math teacher. A lot of really good activities going on on your, on your site here. Um, but this is a really nice way to explore polar coordinates. I discovered this a couple years back uh, while trying to teach this for the first or second time, and it changes everything when you're looking at polar stuff. So really encourage you to run that. This uh, website version will run in any browser pretty much. It might not run on your phone, but it'll run in any browser. So check the video description for that. A uh, really helpful thing. And then, of course, Desmos.com is going to be our friend for graphing polar. So I'm going to uh, turn away from GeoGebra and come back to Desmos because I want to think about uh, some other properties of the circle. We already saw something really useful, which is that changing the coefficient on the value changes the radius of the circle. We make that a 3. Look, my uh, diameter of the circle is now 3. So it's not the radius here. It's, the, it's technically the diameter of the circle. Want a diameter of 6. What do I do? I make the coefficient 6. Wow, that was pretty easy. We also saw, what if I want my circle to go the other direction? What if I want my circle to be over here on the left? All I need to do is make this negative 6. Kind of makes sense, right? It's just a reflection of the cosine graph we already saw. Um, why does that change so quickly, right? Why is putting a 6 here make this be 6? Well, what happens when you change the coefficient of cosine graph to, say, to 6? What does it do that graph? It makes the graph taller. It makes the maximum higher. The minimum is still 0, but it makes the maximum now 6. And what happened to this graph? It's also over here at 6. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty self-explanatory, why the radius uh, diameter changes along with this. Only tricky thing there is to remember that it is the diameter and not the radius, unlike every other time we've done circles. Now, circles would be pretty boring if all we could do was circles on the left and circles on the right. I want to make a circle that goes up and down. I really want a circle like not right here. Well, there's another an easy way to do that. All you have to do is take your trig value, trig function, and change it from cosine to sine. Take a look at this. Take a look at this. There's our 6 sine theta. 6 is too big. I like, I like 2. Let's look at 2 sine theta. All right, so we're looking at 2 sine theta here. Um, it still only needs to go from 0 to pi to make a full circle. And we now have a circle oriented vertically. Changing the coefficient still changes the radius, uh, the diameter of the circle. Right, so there's a diameter of 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 4 there. Pretty easy. Making that negative puts the circle on the negative side of the axis for pretty obvious reasons. 
right? So I want a negative two circle. I can live down there. Pretty cool. Ah, well, why does this happen? Let me go back to positive two. Why does this happen? Why does this happen? Well, let's go back to our graph. So now I'm going to change this to two sine t. And we'll wind our graph back. You know what the graph of two sine t looks like, right? You know what the graph of sine looks like. It starts at zero, then increases to its maximum value at pi over two, and then decreases back to zero. And so let's see how that is mirrored in the polar graph. We're starting at a radius of zero. Remember that the vertical axis on the left is actually kind of like the radius, kind of. It is this going to match the radius on the right. So as you move this point out, the radius slowly increases just like the uh, sine graph slowly increases. Oh, look, the sine graph is at its maximum. It's kind of snapping to the maximum. The sine graph is at its maximum value. What happened to the circle? It's at its tallest point. It's furthest point away from zero. And as the radius moves back around, the sine graph is starting to slowly decrease. Sine graph slowly decreasing. So as theta increases through quadrant two, the radius slowly decreases also. Notice that here, the angles in quadrant two and the graphs in quadrant two. Why is that? Right, we did, unlike cosine, we don't have any weird negative radii yet. Why is that? Well, because look what's happening over here on the other side. You're all above the x-axis. When we draw the second circle around, then this second circle is going to be drawn exclusively, oh, excuse me, exclusively with negative radii. Take a look at this. All right, so there's our first circle at pi, 3 minus 4. There we go. Let's draw the second circle. It's going to draw the second circle again. Theta is going to sweep through the uh, third and fourth quadrants, but the radius in those quadrants is negative, as you can see from the sine graph. So it's just going to draw the same circle again with a negative radius because the sine graph has that vertical reflective symmetry, right? This curve is the same as this curve. So if we're looking at just the same curve with a negative radius, we're going to get the same circle. All right. So what have we learned about circles and polar circle graphs? Um, and again, this is just the, the first family of all polar graphs that we can possibly look at. Um, the two types of polar circle graphs are r equals cosine theta, we should say maybe uh, a cosine theta, and r equals a sine theta. Um, polar circle graphs always contain the origin, right? Because sine and cosine always have some value where they pass through zero. Um, the a value, uh, the a value is the diameter. Uh, or the other side of the circle. Cosine circles uh, are oriented horizontally. What do I mean by that? I mean that the uh, other side that's not the origin is on the x-axis. Sine circles are oriented vertically. This is also really easy to remember if you remember your polar conversions. Remember that x is r cosine theta. So obviously, I mean, it makes sense that cosine circles would be oriented along the x-axis because x is defined as r cosine theta, and y is defined as r sine theta, and that's what makes a vertical-oriented circle. So we have this kind of nice connection between the conversion factors from polar that you, you learned last time and these uh, different types of circles. Uh, and then negative circles, negative uh, a values reflect the circle. I know how to spell. Uh, no, I don't. There we go. Negative A values reflect the circle. I will say this. I don't think you should memorize a lot of polar graphs. I don't. I mean, they're, they're not very useful. Do you need a rose curve flying around in your everyday life? Heck no. But you know what? I've been doing a lot of calculus, a lot of multivariable calculus teaching, and we use these all the time. All the time. So if you're going to pick two really one kind of polar graph to learn and memorize and actually learn how to graph without consulting your notes. So I would pick these. I would put a big rainbow, fancy, festive star by these and say, learn how to graph these polar graphs because one, they're easy, and two, they're unbelievably useful at all times. So if you're wandering around in calculus and you see, oh my gosh, R equals negative six sine theta, you don't have to go all the way to your graphing calculator. You can say, oh, I know what that is. It's a circle, sine t, oriented vertically. Okay, it's going to have a go through the origin with a diameter of 6. And because it's negative, it's going to be opening down. So right away, you could say, 
excuse this drawing by the way, that that graph will have that equation. So uh, really, really helpful to know. Okay, it's been 25 minutes. I'm gonna leave it here. Please tune in for the next video where we talk about rose curves and limasons. Really cool graphs. Uh, we'll see those next time though.